Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm glad I'm going to, again, try not to waste any time and straight introducing our next speaker. The next two presentations will be sharing, at least uh, on a very obvious level, the concern with liminal animals. And Philippa Ramos is uh, an art critic and uh, a teacher in Venice and at Kingston in London, um, and uh, formerly head of research at Documenta 13 and many other things. And uh, Philippa is going to talk about tigers and thresholds. Welcome, Philippa. So um, my presentation is um, an attempt to respond and to relate to Anson's um, invitation to to take part in this um, in these uh, series of um, debate days, and it will depart from the analysis, or it will be grounded in the analysis and in, in, in the commentary of uh, three specific. Um, figures, let's say, um, and through the dialogue with these three figures, somehow I'm, I'm trying to address the subject of animal embedment um, through um, somehow to, to com comprehend the constitution of their relations to notions of territories and boundaries and belongings. And these three cases are the first, the one that you see here, it's a lithographic print from the late 19th century, from 1885, by a German um, illustrator called Heinrich uh, Leutemann. And the print is entitled, Road Surveying Interrupted in Singapore. Um, the second figure is um, a film from 2004 by a Thai filmmaker called A Pichapong Verzetakur. And the film is called Tropical Malady. And the third one, if you're not entirely familiar with Tropical Malady, you might be with this one, because I know it was, um, during the recent, just today, told me it was part of the, of um, these sessions. And it's a film by a British filmmaker called Philip Warnell, and it's called Ming of Harlem. Um, and I will take in consideration um, the various relations that the, the common denominator to these three elements, which is the presence of a tiger, um, and the relations that these animals establish with the sets where they're situated and that traversing them. Um, writing in um, the early 1980s, specifically 1980, um, the essayist and, and art critic John Berger um, in a very well-known um, essay, which is entitled, Why Look at Animals? He sustains that the 19th century saw the beginning of a process, today being completely, being completed, completed by the 20th century, he was writing in 1980, corporate capitalism by which every tradition which has previously mediated between man and nature was broken. Before this rupture, animals constituted the first circle of what surrounded man. Man, animals were constituted a circle. Um, and with a less anthropocentric, but with an equally, with a similar dualistic argument, the um, cultural theorist and, and, and scholar Akira Mizutalipit um, oh, okay. sustains that 
quoting, everywhere one looks is surrounded by the absence of animals. No longer a sign of nature's abundance, animals now inspire a sense of panic for the Earth's dwindling resources. Spectral animals recede into the shadows of human consumption and environmental destruction. This he wrote in um, this part of a book called The Electric Animal from 2000. Um, many, many others follow these considerations and, ex and explore the almost mathematical re relation of inversely proportion that exists uh, between the human transformation of territories and the occurrence of moments of unexpected encounter with those beings that are, were located within these places. Accordingly, there's the widespread notion that nature is replaced by culture, that self-regulatory, self-preserved ecosystems are replaced by sets of artificially organized synthetic arrangements. Bearing these considerations in, in mind, my attempt here is to engage uh, with, or uh, almost in, in, um, my attempt to uh, accept her invitation and to um, engage with a proposal um, by Donna Haraway uh, in a text that she published in Environmental Humanities last year in 2015, a text called Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Plantationocene, Stulocene, Making Kin, which had biggest motto that I strongly embrace, but I will embrace in another consideration, not here, is make kin, not babies. Um, but in this text, uh, Haraway declares that our job is to make the Anthropocene as short or as thin as possible, and to cultivate with each other in every way imaginable epochs to come that can replenish refuge. Um, we need stories and theories somehow, um, that are just big enough to gather up the complexities and to keep the edges open and greedy for surprising new and old connections, to join forces, to re reconstitute refugees, and to make possible partial and robust biological, cultural, political, technological recuperation and recompositions, which must also include mourning of irreversible losses. And being so, my attempt is to look towards Haraway through the frame of, um, of art, or through the frame, or through, with these three cases, following the same animal with three stories that are not necessarily interconnected and which are not necessarily presented in the same length and in the same mode, which hopefully uh, the observation of these three moments will allow us to have a glimpse of hybrid terrains and zones of outlandish encounter that resist or are simply indifferent to these dualistic simplifications and uh, which may also contribute to constitute, to reconstitute, to maintain these uh, refu refugee areas in both poetic and concrete zones that defy the notion of everywhere desert that Lippitt is proposing when he says that everywhere we look we see no animals. So Heinrich Leutemann wrote surveying interrupted in Singapore, 1885. Um, the print de depicts this moment in which an Irish civil architect, George Drumgold Coleman, uh, who in 1833 had been appointed by the British Colonial Agency as um, superintendent of the public works and surveyor of convict labor in Singapore, and depicts the moment in which Coleman is with a group of uh, forced laborers, and they meet a tiger. The print has been chosen, this is very recently, to open the recently inaugurated National Gallery of Singapore, being the first work that visitors encounter when they enter the museum, um, and therefore somehow setting the tone that the curator for the curatorial approach to the display of this collection which I would characterize as an attempt to explore the intertwinement between artistic representation, historical contextualization, and mythical account that surrounds the edification of the cultural identity of the Asian city-state. Classified as one of the four tiger economies, together with South Korea and with Taiwan and, and Hong Kong, 
Singapore's historical and present relation to the tiger, and with the various and sometimes contradictory uh, roles that this animal has played in the territory's geopolitics, from being a symbol of the invasive Japan, to represent the communist meth menace, to traverse the most shamanistic accounts of human-animal transformative procedures, just to name a few, is therefore acknowledged and explored by the museum by uh, using the sprint um, to introduce uh, its collection and to allow it to establish a series of associations. The scene supposedly depicts uh, an event which took place in 1835, exactly when Coleman was appointed in this mission of transforming the Malayan Peninsula and, and, and um, assuring the urbanization of Singapore. Um, and Coleman describes it in the following way. He says that he was accompanied by a body of convicts laying out a new, while they were laying out a new road through a low, swampy part of the jungle about four miles from town in the act of taking an observation through his teodolite when the crashing sound was heard among the bushes close by and a huge tiger leaping from the thick and lush vegetation surprised Coleman and the convicts. Um, doublessly alarmed by a commotion occasioned, the animal immediately sprung into the jungle again and disappeared. So appeared, then went back. The lithography depicts the exact moment in which the tiger leaps and meets the group. Some of the convicts, as you can see, lose balance and um, fall into the ground thus being deprived of their bipedal condition, which is um, one of the last remains um, that defines their being human. Um, and while others seem to be less exposed to the menace of this animal by being under the shade of a parasol, dark hidden figures who are protected by their quasi invisibility, they are transparent even to the tiger's gaze following Anna's comments on, on Jurassic Park, that if you don't move, the Tyrannosaurus won't see it. If you're in the shade, somehow the, the tiger's perception won't, um, won't meet your presence. Coleman is equally surprised, yes, less troubled. And he faces the tiger while his arm is being pushed by an assistant who is either falling down and holding to him to keep his balance, or protectively moving him away from the animal. Amid this, a theodolite, which is a delicate topographic precision measuring uh, tool for calculating the angles of horizontal and, and vertical plans, is on the verge of collapsing to the ground. With a photographic accuracy, um, Leutemann has depicted the scene exactly on its moment of in-betweenness, in which everything is on the verge of happening, but without disclosing the outcome. The tiger hasn't completed its leap. The humans haven't yet been attacked. The theodolite hasn't reached the ground. And the jungle's vegetation hasn't been cleared, cut, and flattened to render visible the particular topography of this place, which is about to be mapped, itemized, measured, inscribed, transcribed, and triangulated, uh, and borrowing a, a an, an expression used by, by or a, a short sentence and a combination of verbs um, used by Latour in relation to um, mapping and um, controlling territories. And there are still no names or numbers associated to this um, language-free landscape. Right? To map or to guide um, Coleman and, and his team. Only the tiger seems to be the one who has a map, which is made of smells, of textures, and of temperatures, more than of visual reference points. Coleman is there exactly to capsize this relation to space, to make sure that people will orientate themselves better than tigers. And what we're observing um, is the exact moment of this transmutation of this site into yet another and another rendering of it, which is not necessarily clear. Um, and uh, again, as Latour suggests, suggests, according to our land surveyors, the difference between a tropical jungle and a concrete one is not that big. One gets lost in both, in the former due to the lack of landmarks, and in the later due to the excess of signs, nails, posts, and marks that one has to learn to distinguish. 
An attentive look, though, at this, at this image and not at this agitated party shows that the tiger's interest doesn't seem to be on the group of men, but on the theodolite, the measuring instrument they carry, which is an argument that has been thoughtfully um, explored, in particular by an academic, Kevin Schwa, in an article from 2007 called The Tiger and the Theodolite, and uh, also plastically explored by, the, by an artist who Ansem has worked with, uh, Ho Tzu Nien, in his play of Shadows of 10,000 Tigers. And this, these suppositions of, um, these previous suppositions somehow allow us to invert the dialectics of the encounter between humans and non-humans and consider the fact that everything leads us to believe that it is the tiger who was willingly manifesting himself to the group with a clear desire of connecting with them. And in saying this, I'm clearly standing and in, in, in attributing an, an intentionality to, to the animal. As a parenthesis and as a very brief parenthesis, I, I, I see and uh, I would upgrade this scene in not only Alex's um, video fragment of the octopus stealing the GoPro, but also of the, all those fragments that you can see on, on, on YouTube of animals grabbing drones and being interested by, by them. And just more often than not, they're always entitled uh, animal, I don't know, hawk, cheetah, whatever, attacking, attacking drone. But my theory is that also these animals are curious by this element and they want to, to keep, keep it and, and take them to their closeness. But it is clear that this manifestation of animals that have still that moment been unseen um, starts happening during this period of transformation of the land. Despite the, the fact that tigers have lived in the Mal Malaysian Peninsula for millennia, the first existing record of the presence of a tiger in the territory of Singapore dates from 1831 through news that states that tiger are, tigers are beginning to infest the vicinity of town, and that not many days ago, the friends of a Chinese woodcutter discovered the head and part of the leg of their companion in the th thicket not far from the rear of a Chinese temple. Further on, there's another newspaper from 1855 that is, sustains the, the following. The population of Singapore is really being converted into food for tigers. And the inhabitants are departing and are, <coughs> are departing as regularly as steamers. Uh, and the, the, the news continues and expresses the concern about the rapid depopulation of Singapore by tigers, fearing that the evil will go on increasing or in other words, that the population will go diminishing. These news reveal the existence of a zone in which the opposite of what had been theorized by Berger, Lippitt, and others occurs. That a certain moment of the acceleration of the process of modernization, which led to a widespread movement of urbanization, ruralization, so on, of areas that were previously inhabited, the growth of inevitable interspecies encounters takes place, one which wasn't always peaceful nor embedded in the so-called curiosity of the human towards the animal, but that was often shaped by an attraction of these animals towards humans and their objects, which is, um, I don't have much time, which is somehow in parallel to Haraway's thesis of the self-domestication process of the wolf dog, wolves getting closer to human settlements due to interest in, in, in food, in warmth, in other theories, and not that human actually um, did an active process of domestication uh, of the dog. Um, such inverted relationship allows me for the conception that actually culture may be followed by nature if there ever are one and the other and they're not actually walking intimately together. In a recent paper, um, an anthropology professor and mushroom expert, Anna Tsing, points out to the need to maintain places of refuge, which can sustain rewirling in rich cultural and biological diversity, and which can support the rebirth of forms of refuge for humans and non-humans alike. Appearing and then disappearing, 
As described by Col Coleman's account, the tiger returns to his material refuge zone. He also returns to an immaterial refuge embedded in a ghostly aura. The concrete presence of the animal in these territories has been sublimated and re-emerged in various allegorical phantasmagorias that recuperated the traditional myths associated with the possibility of the human and the non-human to traverse the respective ontological confinements and become other. And it is exactly in this period that were jaguars, were wolves, were tigers found their ways from the age of time across the pathways constituted by, of course, the Victorian troubles and fascination and passion for the supernatural, for the bestial, for the uncanny, haunting the bad conscience of the imaginary of the colonialist with an irrational fear for any form of other, which leads us to move to a ghost story to set in more or less the same geographical area, but in more than a century apart. And I'm moving to a picture upon versatical tropical melody. Narrating the love story between a young farmer, Tong, and a soldier, Kang. Kang is this one, Tong is the other one. A picture upon versatical film is structured through two main segments, a first and a second part, that while appear to establish a counterpoint between rural urbanity and jungle, civilization and wildness, medicine and magic, tame and wild, reveal the interconnectedness and inextricability of these ecologies, while exploring the unique potential for cinema to act as a bastion of encounter between technology, narrative, and animality. The first part of the film is signed by the encounter of two young men, whose fondness for one another ambiguously intertwines friendship and sexual desire, their relationships evolving amid their respective familiar zones, between their houses, their parents, their colleagues, neighbors, as well as in new terrains that the couple explores together as a karaoke site where vernacular music gains a, an intimate depth at, at the cinema and at the cave in which they enter with a niece. The second part of Tropical Malady depicts both men's mutual quest for one another and involves in a gradual tension where the complexities that are inherent to the impulses of attraction and repulsion, desire and fear, human and non-human, are fully disclosed one more beyond their classical dualisms of either or. The second part is set in the forest where vegetation is so thick that barely any sunlight reaches the ground level, at the, and the, um, a large part of the scenes are actually set in darkness, and much has been written and said about Versetokul's use of, of, of darkness and the use of film in relation to what you can see and what you can't see. Making this film visually demanding and hallucinatory as it blurs the distinction between what is seen and what is imagined, between day and night, between before and after. Our perceptual means, and those of Tong and Kang, but also ours as viewers, are challenged and they are exposed to a large effort of adaptation in an attempt to regain the capacity to establish any form of orientation. It is in this environment that Tong, ambiguously incarnated in a shaman who turns into a weird tiger, exists across the boundaries of an man, animal, and ghost, inviting Kang to join his world. His renewed animal body allowing for the consecration of a pre-existing affective and sexual bond that traverses species, bypasses laws and customs, <coughs> and exists outside of time. This relationship in potency that we see evolving in the first part of the film can only open itself and be fully articulated due to the dislocation of the action to the site of the forest. In such open and mappable terrain, all the dialectics of this couple can be dismantled and scattered, and their individual ontologies can be dissented and diluted. The forest is a welcoming place for this explosion of the self to happen due to it, it, its indifference. It's neither hostile nor protective. It's neither regulated nor chaotic. It's where Tong and Kang are neither owners or foreigners, and they're located in a place that is indifferent to time, to morals, to ethics, or to language. In fact, the only moments of verbal exchange happen outside of the human, via third figures. 
One occurs through a machine, which is a portable walkie-talkie um, that Kang uses to communicate with his fellow soldiers, which transmits disembodied voices and scratched sounds that buzz like mechanical insects. He's trying to, to speak with his patrol, and, and he can't. And what you hear are these mechanical uh, insect-like sounds. And they do little more than enhancing the separation between Kang and his, and his group and his own vulnerability and helplessness. The, omen, the other moment occurs not through spoken words, but via written text, in which subtitles appear on the screen and verbally translate what a small macaque, which is perched on a tree, tells to Kang. The macaque says, the tiger trails you like a shadow. His spirit is starving and lonesome. I see you are his prey and his companion. He can smell you from the mountain away, and soon you will feel the same. Kill him and release him into the ghost world, or let him devour you and enter his world. A creature traditionally located halfway between humans and non-humans, a monkey, sustains that Kang has to make a decision. He either turns the animal into a spirit, or he lets his humanity be embodied within the tiger by allowing him to eat his flesh. Yet, he, he seems to do more than that, as Kang divorces the tiger's soul. And together, as one, they are neither human nor animal, and they are released into one another. There is a sense of real time in the second part of the film, which lasts for about one hour, giving the viewer the impression of accompanying the action live during its entire length. At the same time as the tension between the two lovers grow into a feverish hallucination, the viewer is immersed with them in the jungle and induced to a state of suspension. There is now no outside here, there is no distance, there is no sense of control. The decentering is common to everyone engaged in this moment. As it goes as far as decentering cinema's intrinsic relation to the visual, as the film's outcome happens not through images, but through sound. When we hear that every drop of my blood sings our song, a song of happiness, there. Can you hear it? The camera slowly scans the vegetation, moved by the wind, and the images resume to black. What time is it? Okay. I'd like now to explore a third case of interspecies encounter, which is instead framed within an urban set, not less outlandish, by analyzing Philip's, Philip Warnell's film. And before doing so, I will just add some contextualization to the film. Between 2000 and 2003, Antoine Yates lived with Ming, Al, Shadow, and other less permanent guests of a 21-story public housing complex in Harlem, New York. Antoine Yates was a 37-year-old North American citizen. Ming was a three-year-old 500 pound Bengal tiger that Antoine had bought when he was a cub from an animal park in Minnesota. L was a seven foot long alligator, also acquired through contacts with exotic animal dealers and breeders, and Shadow was a black and white domestic cat. Other former occupants of the house included children taken in custody by Yale's Yates' mother as the seven-room apartment was registered as a foster home, and other guests. The filming of Harlem presents detailed portraits of Antoine, of Al, and of Ming, and the space they shared, the moments sometimes accompanied by Jean-Luc Nancy's response to the film, a long poem entitled Art, the Language, Animals, and in, in relation to one another. In October 2003, Yates sought treatment at the Harlem Hospital for what he claimed to be 
a bite from his pit bull. He sustained he had a pit bull and that the people had attacked him and that he had bitten by the, the, the dog. Due to the width of the bite marks, the doctors understood that that was either a monstrous pit bull or it couldn't be a dog. And the medical personnel alerted the authorities. So while Waits was being recovered and was being treated, the police was sent to his home. Hearing loud growling noises from the apartment, the officers feared getting in through the door and hanged a rope sling from an upper floor to access it through the window. While the policeman was suspended in the air, Ming went to the window and clearly responded to this invasive presence that was trying to enter his house. An animal control team was then sent to the apartment and the sharpshooter rappelled down the side of the building and shot the tiger with tranquilizer darts. Agent Martin Duffy's account on his experience with the tiger indoor combines a myriad of emotions which range from optimism and serenity to vigilance, terror and awe. And I'm um, quoting. I was pretty comfortable until I heard him roar. Incredibly, incredibly loud. I'm not gonna lie, you have to be pretty nervous. This is a 500 pound tiger at the top of the animal chain. You just have to stock it up and be a man. When I saw him, he was laying down, really peaceful. Then he looked at me, ready to make a move. I took a shot and I hit him in the hint. And that's when he went berserk. Initially, he charged away, and when he hit the inferior wall, I could feel the outside wall of the building shaking. That's how powerful he was. Then he turned around and just charged at the window. All I saw was his giant head with a mouthful of giant teeth coming at me. That's when I was like, all right, I'm going to be eaten by a tiger. He was magnificent, this beautiful fur, an amazing creature. It was only when the apartment was accessed that the alligator and the cat were further discovered. <laughs> In consequence, Ming, Al, and Yates found themselves beh behind bars. The tiger was sent to an animal sanctuary in Ohio, the alligator to an animal shelter in New Jersey, and Antoine was convicted of reckless endangerment and served a three-month prison sentence. Rather than exploring the ethical and the legal consequences of keeping an white, wild animals as pets in an apartment in a large city, you see here Al, being transported, <coughs> and Ming being transported. Shadow is being transported as well when he comes back from hospital. So rather than exploring the ethic and legal consequences of keeping wild animals as pets in an apartment in a large city, the film Ming of Harlem operates a visual and tactile investigation of one's closeness to these animals whose skins, fur, and movements are scrutinized during, during long moments. This emphasis on the animal's bodies introduces a cinematic reconstitution of the relation between these three individuals, a restorative mourning for their mutual losses. In parallel to such visual ritual, Ornell questions how such situation was sustained by imagining how the cohabitation of man and animals was negotiated within the house, a space that was simultaneously a domestic environment, a functional house with no green area nor open contact to the exterior, a territory that was defended by the animal against its invasion by another animal, and therefore what in zoology is generally called a home range, an area that an animal regularly crosses to fulfill its needs, but also an enclave, an isolated parcel surrounded by a larger territory whose inhabitants were culturally, ethically, and biologically different. A non-so-secured area within another non-so-secured area. A blank spot, which managed to be organized according to its own laws and evade control and surveillance. And in that sense, a, den, a, didden, a, a hidden private space. In the house, Yates and Mink, in particular, are folded into each other in a relationship of interdependency, sharing their solitude and isolation, and establishing a form of companionship
that Yeats expresses in deeply effective and emotional terms. Throughout the film, Yeats appears seated in a car that is circulating through the streets of New York. Filmed from the outside, there's a camera mounted in the car in the outside of the vehicle, he looks through the window and talks about what he sees, recalling moments and places. The car keeps Yeats in a confined space, separating him from the city while moving across it. Locked inside the sort of aquarium, where Yeats also becomes subject of close observation. Concurrently, Warnell conceived a device for, southern, for further inquiring upon the relationship between the animal and the confined space, generating an experiment in which a one-to-one -one replica of the house was built inside a tiger's territory in a zoo. <laughs> the footage that documents the tiger's relation to this house constitutes a substantial part of the film. By spending extended periods of time looking at the ways in which the tiger is interacting with the house, crossing it, rubbing itself in it, spraying it, scratching it, filling it with sounds, it becomes clear that there is no form of separation between the two. The house, which had already been a cross-border location for men and tiger, offers itself as a space of permeability of animal space boundaries. Neither domestic nor wild, neither helpful nor harmful, neither pet nor pest nor beast, Mink seems to be immune to the consuetary dinary classifications that locate this animal within a network of roles and symbols. Yet he wasn't simply socially incorporated as a member of the household. The tiger becomes the house, and the house becomes the tiger. Impregnated with this presence, with its others, substances, gestures, uses. With his presence, the tiger naturalizes the space. The house becomes a determined and as determined and subjugated by architecture as by the animal, who was deeply implicated in its decay, in its corruption, in its collapse, and undermining. A space that actively produced an indeterminate instability, as it was also attested by Yates' neighbors from the floor below, who complained about having infiltrations of urine in their walls. At the same time as this space was outside of legislation, miserability and power, it was also filled and superimposed by the animal. It had the animal within it. Flat 5E was infused in the tiger's sweet and acidic others. Some sp say that the spraying of tiger smells of buttered popcorn. Some say it smells of basmati rice. This space was the set for a relation between bodies and bodies, bodies with different configurations, not only between human bodies and animal bodies, but between living and objectual bodies, somehow indistinct from one another. This was a house that broke up with the notion that nature corresponded to a wild animal's world. The relation between house and mink pushed the daily practice of intersubjectivity between animal and human towards a relation that is established between living and non-living, in which ownership and control are operated not by possession or education, but by permeability. This was a house that smelled of basmati rice, a house that roared, a house that moaned, hissed, growled, and chuffed. As a matter of conclusion, and I'm just about to finish, we had a tiger ghost fascinated with technology, blood that sings, and a house that roars. In different ways, these three cases propose modes of spatial engagement and conceptions of matter as a lively figure dotted with agency, whose molecules are deeply embedded within both the material realities of everyday life and with broader geopolitical, environmental, and cognitive structures. These human-animal relations that stand at the crossroads of cultural and environmental concerns reconstitute, I hope, poetic and concrete places of shelter that should continue to exist, to change, and be cons constantly negotiated. <laughs>